Hello? 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 It's on? It's on? It doesn't feel like it's on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so before um, Mr. Mickey preaches, um, <laughs> he wants me to share a verse of uh, Hebrews 4, 14, and 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. Thank you. Especially thank you today. And I will say on Kirsten's behalf, Kevin, you're in trouble. Because she didn't get that text until we started singing this morning. Uh, so thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, John says there's bottles of water in the back if anybody would like a bottle of water. And I saw them bringing a fan out here, and I thought, oh, good. right? And I don't know where it went, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, on the one Sunday that I'm not automatically in the back, John announces it's much cooler back there. I couldn't be more up front. Right? So, uh, difficult passages. Today we'll be looking at the security of the believer, or what is falling away, or backsliding, or can the Christian lose his salvation? And... I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to ask you, um, be patient with me. This is the last one of these difficult passages that I'm doing, I believe. Um, it's, I, I tried my best to keep it less than a half an hour. I, it depends on how I deliver it. Every time I timed myself at home, it was a little more than a half an hour. But I couldn't edit it. If you, if you stay with me, as I go through the passages, we're building an argument, and the totality of it, I think, answers the question pretty soundly, but you have to stay with me. And the scripture we're using is uh, Hebrews in chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. Father, let only what is true be presented here today and for Your glory and in Jesus' name, Amen. Um, so, it's impossible to restore them again to repentance. In between that impossible and restore them uh, is what we have to look at and, and examine what are the circumstances and conditions where it's impossible to restore someone. And a cautionary uh, preface here, uh, this passage uh, comes with contemporary language that we use, like impossible, we all know what impossible means, and a vocabulary of common words that have been adapted to mean theological ideas that we come with, so that when we hear enlightened and partakers, we're, a lot of us are thinking in more religious terms of what that indicates. But we have to remember this was a letter written in the most common language of the day, um, a Koine Greek, um, and, and we're coming to this with all of this already uh, in our heads, looking at this ancient Greek book. Um, just think of, uh, in our own language, I could say that I was holding a piece of jerk chicken and somebody jerked it out of my hand, and I could say, what a jerk to do something like that. You, you know, for somebody that doesn't, that English isn't their first language, there's some explanation necessary with all of that. So exegesis, taking the, the text and drawing out the truth, examining, considering, isn't only useful, sometimes it's necessary. Uh, and the first word that we'll look at here is impossible. 
Impossible here in the original Greek doesn't mean so much how we might use it as without any possibility whatsoever. It actually means powerless to do something, to accomplish something. Um, right? It, it's impossible for me to see my car. It's parked on the other. Um, but it's not impossible. I could get down and ask you to wait for a minute and walk down the hall and open the back door. But if I walk out backwards facing the building, still impossible for me to see my car. If I turn around where my car is but have my eyes closed, it's impossible. So there's all kinds of variables of impossible, but it isn't impossible for me to see my car. Um, there's certain circumstances and conditions where I can see my car. So in what case is this powerlessness? Uh, first, to be enlightened. To, uh, this word enlightened Again, we bring a kind of religiosity to it and think, well, that's indicating people who have experienced it. It's, the word simply means made known of. They have been told. They've been made known of, aware of, of something. They've heard the gospel message uh, and have tasted the heavenly gift. This word tasted, think of how we might say it. Not only am I going to have to um, talk really fast to get through all this, but I know you're all waiting for barbecue uh, at the end of it. If if you say, did uh, did you taste, say, let's pretend, I don't know, Chad brought baked beans. Did you eat any of baked beans, uh, Chad's baked beans? You can say, well, I tasted it. Didn't You didn't have a serving. You didn't eat it, but you tried it. You tasted it. Um, that's kind of what this word means, that they tasted the heavenly gift. It means they made a trial of it. They tried it, um, kind of. Partakers. The word partakers here means to share or associate in some kind of work. Um, they witnessed the goodness of the message in the community that they were a part of. We're all here partaking of the worship service and the singing, and we will be with the food. But not everyone here is on a microphone or behind a pulpit or in the booth. We're all partaking doesn't mean one thing to everybody involved here. And then finally, uh, fallen away. Um, again, we come to this passage and a lot of folks, because of their religious training and teaching behind them, see this falling away as the question that we're asking. Were they Christians and they're not Christians anymore? somehow. But this fallen away simply means to deviate from the path, to go a different way, um, to choose something else. So a paraphrase of this text could read, having heard the gospel message and been with believers in their new community, but having returned to the desires and fears of the world, then what power will the message have for them? How will the message they understood and rejected retain any power for them to change their mind? And here, repentance means change your mind. Having been enlightened, having tasted the heavenly gift, been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, isn't asserting a genuine faith here. It's not identifying them as people who have had a conversion experience. This is lyrical, effusive language that sounds like somebody who's heard the gospel, seemed to respond favorably to its promises, enjoyed the fellowship, but have returned to their old life, gone back to the world. They've fallen away. They've chosen another course. So is that reading of it viable? Um, you, we, we just look at the text. We read it. It seems to say one thing, and it might seem to say different things. To, we examine the original language and look at it and, and offer, is this the meaning of it? How we see that depends, I think, very largely on the context. Who's saying it? Who are they saying it to? What have they been saying up to this point? What do they say after? So we have to look at the context. And, and the broad context is the book of Hebrews was written specifically to a new community of disciples of Jesus that were experiencing terrible persecution. And many were under the persecution falling back to the... Uh, availability, acceptability, safety of Judaism. Hebrews is a call for these young believers who have heard the message to endure, to maintain, to not let the persecution cause them to fearfully go back to the way things were. 
And it kind of starts, uh, or will start anyway, in Hebrews chapter 3. Now there's going to be some text here. Stay with me. Hebrews chapter 3 says, Take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be any of you of an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers if we keep the beginning of our commitment firm until the end. So here he introduces, he's talking about falling away, and he introduces the idea of unbelieving of belief or unbelief. And that last statement when he says, for we have become partakers of Christ if we keep the beginning of our commitment. I think we can read that grammatically and think that what he's saying was, if you stay with it and if you keep it, then in the end you will have been, you'll be saved. You'll you'll merit, you'll earn your salvation if you keep it. But, But the Greek grammatical structure of it is we have become partakers, and you'll see that if you keep your commitment. It's kind of like a a general with his aide looking over a battlefield after the battle, and the battlefield is strewn with bodies, and he asks his aide, how many of our men are yet living? And the aide says, the men who stand and walk off the battlefield are the ones that are alive. They're not alive because they stood up and walked off. They didn't They didn't get aliveness by standing up. They stood up because they're alive. He's saying here, we have become partakers. And you'll see that if we keep our commitment. If we don't keep our commitment, if we fall back, apparently we have not become partakers. He goes on in the same passage to say, While it is said, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart as they did when they provoked Me. Who provoked Him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was He angry for forty years? And so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Again, it's not if you stick with it, if you endure, uh, it's un, it's you either believe or you don't believe. Um, he's saying here, he says, when they heard, they heard the promises, they heard the message, but some didn't enter because of unbelief. Is why they didn't enter. In the next chapter, he goes on. Therefore, we must fear, while a promise remains of entering his rest. If any one of you may seem to have come short of it, for indeed we have the good news preached to us, just as they did. But the word they heard did not benefit them because they were not united with those who listened in faith. Again, he's he's driving home the point that the matter of the genuineness of your salvation depends on belief. These, These people fell short. That's why they didn't enter in. They had the good news preached to them, the text says, but the Word did not benefit them because they were not united to those who listened in faith, believing the Word. So he's he's setting up this picture where there are people in the community who have heard the message and who seem to be part of the community, but they some have fallen short. They've never fully become part of the community. And the distinction, the difference is, did they actually believe? Was it a matter of faith, or were they just caught up in some way in the in the community? The next verse, or the next chapter, chapter 5, he goes on to say, concerning him, the him is Melchizedek, we won't go into that, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become poor listeners. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unacquainted with the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to distinguish between good and evil. Here, he's talking about the difference between hearing the word and doing the word. Because of practice, because they were doing it. They were, they were more than hearing it, they were doing it, and so they could distinguish between. And he mentions this 
you should be teachers, but instead you need someone to teach you the elementary principles of the actual words. As we get to our text here, the passage just before our text in chapter 6 says, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation, foundation of what? These elementary principles, talking to these people who he's about to say, talking about falling away. What are the elementary principles he's talking about? Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Again, the, the, the point that he's making here and the distinction to be made between those who fell away and those who didn't wasn't just the fact of falling away or not. It wasn't about their endurance. It was about who really believed it. Who had moved past didn't need to keep hearing again the foundations of the elementary principles of repentance of faith from dead work or repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and about the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And all this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and to have then fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. So it's in the case of those. That's what, what we need to understand and identify who those are that he's talking about falling away and all that he's been talking about leading up to this passage that we're uh, giving our attention to is there's a distinction between hearing the word and being with those who believe the word but not being united to those who believe the word because you're not hearing it in faith you're just kind of part of the community you're going along um, and then he comes to this the very next passage after this it's very interesting for the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it, produces vegetation useful to those for whose sake it has been tilled, receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Does anybody want to holler out to the guy on the microphone what passage this sounds like or reminds you of? If it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless. A parable, probably the most famous of Jesus' parables in Matthew. I heard sower. This parable of the sower is about the word being presented to everybody. And, it, and, the, and one soil accepts the seed and has fruit and grows and is healthy. And then there's three soils described as not re either they just don't even receive it and they reject it or they seem to listen to Matthew 13 22 and the one sown with seed among the thorns is the one who hears the word and the anxiety of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful it's interesting compellingly interesting to me that in this passage where he's talking about it's impossible for those who have fallen away to be uh, to, to come back, to, to, to bring them back, to restore them, that he then immediately goes to for the ground that produces and, and talks about this thorns. You, when they knew the parables of Jesus, and this parable is explaining exactly what all of the passages leading up to this have been talking about, that you can hear the word, you can be in the community, you can be following a, a lot of the customs or rules, um, but there's a difference between hearing in faith and believing and just having it a, a cultural thing that you're in the midst of. Uh, so this idea of falling away is addressed in the matter of not enduring. Those who seeming to be favor or they seem to be favorable to the gospel and appearing fruitful for a bit, but they go back to their old life having become partakers of Christ if we keep the beginning of our commitment. The whole book of Hebrews is about enduring, about if you really believe this, if you've heard the message and you've experienced conversion and you believe it to be true, then, then follow through with it. Go on 
to be fruitful and mature. If that doesn't happen, apparently you've not really been ex have experienced conversion and faith and so forth. The passage, you know, they went out from us because they were not of us. Because if they had really been of us, they wouldn't have gone out from us, but would still be with us and so forth. This idea of falling away haunts many of us fearing to lose their salvation. What causes believers to question or doubt their salvation? Uh, the catechism question was scheduled for last week, but we bumped it to this week to just mention briefly here because it's right in the answer of, of the question that we're asking today. And the catechism question was, into what estate did the fall of did the fall bring mankind? And the answer is the fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. And so we struggle with selfishness, pride, lust, fear, anxiety, and worry. Last week, John talked about uh, the Christian dealing with anxiety and worry, teaching that anxiety may not itself may not be a sin, but it comes from sin. It, it's here because we're fallen people. So why do we doubt our salvation? The dictionary calls anxiety a feeling of worry, nervousness, unease, typically about an imminent, real or perceived threat with an uncertain outcome. It's that perceived and uncertain, I think, that, that gives us uh, anxiety. Anxiety and worry comes from fear. Fear produces doubt, and doubt is a result of a lack of faith. Our safety, our power, our union with Jesus isn't grounded in our faith, but grounded in His faith. Our salvation stands not on our ability to muster up just enough of the right kind of faith, our salvation stands on God's election, on His electing love. And however we understand these terms, whatever ideas we bring from ourselves into these terms, these weren't concocted by Paul or Augustine or Luther or Calvin or Edwards or, or the history of the church. Uh, that's what the Bible teaches. We were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Our salvation is not based on, built on, or dependent on our faith, but is established by His deliberate divine will and purpose. Faith means, or faith is the means that God delivers salvation to us. It's not because, and if we do it just right, it's the way. The, the passage reads that we're saved by grace through faith. It's through faith rather than works or obedience or being born in the right community, whatever. It's through the means of faith that God delivers us His grace. And it's not because we're smart enough or good enough to believe the gospel that God decided to save us. Our belief, our faith, is part of our salvation. It's part of the gift. We're told in the passage I just quoted that we're saved by faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Even our faith is part of the salvation that God has determined to grant to us freely. Yet we're plagued by anxiety. Anxiety comes from fear, and fear uh, often about being judged by others. And, and trying just a little bit here to not be too theological, uh, but more practical, uh, there are mechanisms, tools, ways to deal, um, like practical ways to deal with, uh, with fear. Like, like this, e every year in psychiatric magazines and journals, the number one fear that people have is speaking in public, um, speaking to a group. Uh, there are the, to me, the mechanism of overcoming that fear is there's no such thing as a group. I know almost all of you people. I can speak to you individually. Just because you're all here at the same place at the same time <laughs> doesn't turn you from the people you are into some group. That, that has evil intent or wishes me ill or whatever. If I can speak to you all individually, then there, there are mechanisms, there are ways inside yourself that you can deal with this and just speak to, um, to individual people who you know who just all happen to be here at the same place at the same time. One of my favorite passages, because it seems so logical, sensible, analytical, uh, after Paul instructs uh, us not to worry about things, food and clothes, uh, before he promises God cares for us more, uh, 
I think this is Paul. Now I'm thinking, now I'm doubting myself. Is it a Psalm? Uh, flowers uh, are more uh, beautiful under God's care and so forth. He says, which of you can wor by worrying can add a single day to his lifespan? It doesn't work anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, John last week described some scenarios where, and I absolutely agree, I'm just no good at it, but I absolutely agree that you can't just say to somebody, we'll just get over it. We'll just don't do that anymore. I don't know. That's all I have in some scenarios. To me, it's like, it's not helping you. It doesn't do any good to worry about it. So stop worrying. I don't know kind of what, if I, my car's in the shop right now, I have one of my daughter's cars. If I was sitting here thinking, I don't know if the car's going to start uh, when I leave here. If I sat here thinking, what if it doesn't start? And I don't know if it's going to start or not start. And if I, what am I going to do if it doesn't start? None of that energy, attention, spent has anything to do with the ignition on that car. And if it's going to start, it's not helping at all. So just, so I just don't do it. I just, I'll pay attention to what's going on. And when it's time to leave, I'll go out. And the minute I put the key in, I'll think, I wonder if it's going to start or not. You know, and I'll have my wife. It just doesn't, it doesn't help. So don't do it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, kind of mechanism is objectivity. Um, there are some of us here who str are struggling with things that others don't have to struggle with. I fully realize that. But my kind of go-to place that I live on is if you're living in 21st century North America, no matter what your problems are, you're doing way better than anybody living at other times and places. Uh, if you're diagnosed with cancer, if your loved ones are dying, if wh whatever hardships you have that are hardships and that are real, it could be so much worse. You know, you could be a Jew in Egypt thousands of years ago dying of cancer and with loved ones. You know, it, it could always be so much worse. Uh, you know, a, a lot of you know, I'm not, I don't have... Uh, a lot of favorite church songs. Um, they, they just don't kind of get me like they should, like I should have them get me. Uh, it's my fault, but I, I don't. But I always remember the lyric from this one, from when Pixie and I were first starting to go to a church. It was one of the old hymns. And I just, I can never get this verse out of my mind. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? There's always, we have so much more to be thankful for than we think. And it's, it's, it's easy for us, and I recognize that, um, to, to, to kind of turn in on yourself and your own issues and problems. About nine years ago, uh, Pixie had both heart surgery and cancer surgery within a two week period. And, um, and my anxiety and fear was specifically about not having her, about missing her until we're reunited. It's always very uncomfortable to talk about. And I, I don't know how best to say it. Um, but I didn't fret and worry. I didn't think, God, why would you do that? Why is, I, I had a, a trust and a confidence in my father that maybe I shouldn't have. That uh, that what was happening was according to his will and was right and good. And I was prepared um, in the sense of not questioning my faith or, or getting uh, mad at God. Kevin, this is what I was talking about. But I think, I don't know if you're next week or not, but Kevin's uh, difficult passage will be: uh, Is it okay as a Christian to get to question God? And and I told him my answer was no, <laughs> it's not okay. But in particular scenarios like this, it is certainly good to question in in other ways. Um, but I I it wasn't a struggle for me in the sense of what was happening. My concern was I might lose her uh, and, and miss her. But, but our bodies and our lives still function in this way of dealing with that. And when we were in the doctor's office, 
and he came in with the results of her cancer um, surgery um, that there were, was no cancer anymore. Um, he, the door opened and the first thing you saw were the papers of the test results. He walked, he knew Pixie well enough to know, I'm not going to go in there and pussyfoot around. I'm going to walk in results first and tell her directly and immediately there's no cancer. And I was not expecting at all, but I just, the best way I described it, that was, I just felt this dump of stuff out of me that was flooded the floor and smashed against the walls and i and i realized oh is that what people have when they worry and fret about things because i didn't think that i was fretting or worrying um but my body was still collecting all the things to be concerned about and upset about and so forth and it was just but but i i believe that's possible because i experience it that that you can trust god through the most trying circumstances. The path to victory over uncertainty is seek first the kingdom of God and all of this. Well, if you strive for everything to work out just right for you all the time, you're going to be have a life of terrible disappointment because uh, things aren't going to work out well. But if you seek first the kingdom of God, then however things work out, God is there with you. He's, he's there um, through all of it with you. Uh, and you can handle those things. Um, so real quickly, uh, hindrances to assurance, uh, naturally negative disposition. I've got nothing for that. You're kind of on your own. I don't know what to tell you. There are people who just see things in a negative way all the time. Uh, past sins, current sins, past sins are covered. Believe it. That's what the scripture says. Current sins, backsliding, uh, you're not availing yourselves of the means of grace. If you're studying the scripture, if you're with God's people, if you're serious, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, um, you're going to be sinning from time to time. But that's not going to, that shouldn't um, be a hindrance to your assurance because it's not based on you and you're, it's based on God and his faith. Not recognizing the evidences of grace in your life. I think this is a big one. I, I think we become more and more comfortable in the life that God has given us, and we think we're actually smart enough to figure this out. And um, like I should be up here preaching this because my mind works well in this way, and I can put these things together. That's just not the case. God, it's it's because of God's intervening grace and his interest that His truth be proclaimed. If anything I'm saying here today is true, uh, it's because it's from God. Um, both the truth is God's truth, and He's delivering it um, Himself. Uh, it's not our cleverness or our devotion or anything. Um, we need to recognize in our lives the evidences um, of God's grace. Uh, and seeking particular experiences thinking that, that our Christianity should be a certain way, seeing what it is with other people. And, and you know, I, I, it's, it's from the beginning of my um, Christian life when people would say like, oh, he's so holy or good. I wish I could. I, I never quite understood that. He's got, or like oftentimes um, pastors in a pulpit uh, or other circumstances might say, I have all the same struggles you do, and I lose my temper sometimes. And some folks will say, like, wow, that was that was eye-opening. I, I can't believe. And I'm thinking, did you think he didn't lose his temper ever? <laughs> like, like we're, you know, we all have stuff that we're dealing with. Um, don't expect your walk, the path God has put you on, to be just like this other guy's walk or this person's walk. Satan wants to use all these to distress you and to keep you from resting in Jesus and therefore serving him and advancing his kingdom. But Satan is an already defeated foe. And as this is maybe the last difficult passages I'll do, I'll be so bold as to say this. Consider that something may be wrong in your Christian walk if you are elated to come and to sing the songs and to drive in your car and to hear your favorite Christian artist and to pray together. 
But when you're alone at home with God and prayer and his word, if it's if you're if you lose enthusiasm, if it's not as exciting for you anymore, just pray about that. Consider what's happening if if there are things and times you do where you where you find yourself delighting in it all and times where you're alone with God and it's a struggle. Our great hope is that the same Spirit in the apostles at Pentecost is given to us. Working faith, victorious faith, isn't founded in our own power to maintain and endure. The apostles were not maintaining and enduring. They were hiding, confused, fearful. (coughs) Oh my gosh. (coughs) Excuse me. Are you guys awake back there? (laughs) Uh... And they were hiding, confused, and fearful. Working faith, victorious faith, is founded on the truth of Jesus' resurrection and the fact of the gift, the first fruits of the indwelling Spirit. So what are we to do? If we, we, if we believe the message and we trust that we have uh, the, whole, the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit uh, in Peter and, and the others, then what are we to do? The answer is at that event of Pentecost. They were hiding, they were fearful, that uh, Peter particularly was hiding, and now he's in the temple preaching and, uh, and accusations to the people who killed Jesus. And God intervened and added thousands to the church at one time. What's the very next passage? They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Regular, normal Christianity. That's where we live our lives, not looking at others, not expecting something other than what it is. Regular, normal Christianity. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. The biggest hindrances to assurance is not rightly understanding the gospel. You doubt your salvation if you don't realize the work God did in saving you. It's not our work. It's then. You can't crucify to yourself the Son of God again. He did that. He died. It's there. If it was given to you as a gift, it's done. You can't do it again just for you. Um, It doesn't work that way. Think of the priest. When he put his hand on the Lamb, he transferred the sins of the people to the Lamb. He didn't improve the Lamb. He didn't make the Lamb the best Lamb possible who never makes a Lamb mistake or anything anymore. We're going to fall, have faults and failures. And we're not going to live up to um, Christ who we follow. Um, but don't focus on yourself. Focus on God. Texts, I'm wrapping it up here, I promise. Texts that present the truth that when one is saved, he stays saved aren't lyrical and rhapsodic, like enlightened and tasted, but they're instructive facts, didactic, unequivocal. In John's Gospel, he says, Jesus says, you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus says, they will never perish. So you can take the kind of lyrical language and poetry of this, and whatever your first impression might be, um, believe me, I'm not trying to undermine the passage. I'm saying, what does it actually really say? Because if it says what so many come to it thinking it says, then what is this saying? Jesus Himself is saying, my sheep know my voice and they hear me and they will follow me and they will never perish. And how come? Because He says, my Father who has given them to me. That's why. Because the Father has determined to save you and has given you to His Son. You can't undo that. In Romans, Paul says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And and as to enduring, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, God will sustain you to the end, guiltless. Nothing's able to separate us from the love of God because it's in Christ Jesus. And who is Christ Jesus? 
the Lord. Perseverance is a theological doctrine like adoption, forgiveness, conversion, justification, sanctification, propitiation, election, predestination, all of these. But if they're not giving you, informing you, showing you Jesus and drawing you close to Him, then they become pointless. It, it, you know, you, you can think too much of the truths and the arguments of how they fit together and what the, the whole point. Adoption, what a word. All of these should give us Jesus that, and that, that we would um, know Him more personally. Uh, Sunday school class today, Jim asked prayer requests and afterward, and you know, there's a little hesitation, who's going to go first and what are they going to say in prayer? He said, are there any praises? Instantly, Wayne is the first one to talk about praises. His dad just died. <laughs> and when it says, does anybody have any praise? Wayne speaks up. That's because of knowing Jesus. That's not because of the doctrine of sanctification or the doctrine of justice. We, that's all useful and good. We have to understand all that. But we have to understand it to giving us Jesus and who He is. And if, if you know Jesus and He's with you and you're close to Him and that's your Christianity, then even in life's hardest circumstances, you can pray. I remember a preacher once I was listening to saying, he went out fishing with some old guy and the old guy caught a fish, brought it into the boat and says, praise God, we're having fish tonight for dinner. And the fish wiggled and got away. He says, praise God, that's one fish I don't have to clean tonight. <laughs> uh, you can see the good and the right in everything that happens to us here on earth if we seek first the kingdom of God. If because of the truths being taught, you know Jesus. I know that my father is my father because I understand human reproduction and heredity and, and so forth. But I didn't know him. I didn't meet my father till I was in my mid-late 40s, I think it was. Um, so you can know about something and have some understanding about something without knowing them. And again, I think that's what those who have fallen away is talking about. My sheep listen to my voice. I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels and all the rest will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus promises you'll never perish. It's the very nature of the way we're saved makes it impossible for us to lose our salvation. If you understand what God did in saving us, it's a once and done forever uh, idea. How can a man be born, then born again, then unborn again, then born again again? It, it just doesn't make sense or, or add up. The purpose of this passage uh, of all of Hebrews is to call us to press on to maturity, not a teaching that believers can lose their salvation. The larger text introduces this passage in verse 6 with, we have much to say and it's difficult to explain since you have become poor listeners. It asserts solid food is for the mature. This is a call to press on to maturity, assuring true Christians we are convinced of better things regarding you and things that accompany salvation. Kirsten read, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive the mercy and find grace for help in time of our need. Approach, that's one of the paradoxes of our salvation. We are to boldly walk up to the throne of God and with confidence uh, approach our Father because in the same way or similar way and because of some circumstances that Jesus Himself would because we've been filled with the same Spirit. And yet, there's a humility. We need to come humbly, knowing it's not because of us, but it's because of Him. But because of Him, we should walk boldly with confidence. 
And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the end of the day. Father, keep us in your word. Grant us a burden to draw close to Jesus and to know him and love him and obey him more and more. Teach us to believe and help our unbelief. In Jesus' name.